It's Interview Friday, and we're talking peer-to-peer -peer lending. You're in the right place, folks, because this is where the money is. Welcome to the show. It is Friday. I'm Matt Copenheffer. This is David Hansen. David, we are not actually in the office today. You're lying. We're, we're ghosts. We're like holograms. We're like the Tupac hologram. We are in New York uh, for, for an investing conference. Mm -hmm. But we've got the show. Show must go on. It's Interview Friday. Uh, earlier this week, we talked to Ron Suber, the head of global institutional sales for peer-to-peer -peer lender Prosper. Mm -hmm. And we're just going to go right to that interview. Ron had some great stuff to help clarify the uh, the peer-to-peer -peer lending industry for our for our listeners. Let's do it. Let's go right to it. Um, so, Ron, thanks again for joining us. Uh, why don't you start with giving us sort of a high-level overview on what Prosper is? Thank you. At a very high level, Prosper is our country's first marketplace and exchange where prime borrowers and lenders can meet. It's a new asset class, and it's really changing how people interact to borrow and lend. So a few years ago, if you wanted to borrow money, you were limited to going to a physical bank, a high interest rate credit card, your parents, or perhaps your own circle of friends. And what Prosper is doing and peer-to-peer -peer finance is we're changing the way that capital is borrowed and lent in our country. So it's kind of on the on both sides of the coin there for both the borrowing and the lending. Um, that's pretty interesting. And who is who's the competition out there? I know Prosper isn't the only company doing this. Who else is out there doing this? So in our country, there are two major players in the peer-to-peer -peer finance space or the online direct consumer space. It's Prosper and Lending Club, or roughly one-quarter Lending Club size. And in the United Kingdom, there are three major players. And then there are 15 other marketplaces or exchanges around the world in Asia and Latin America and other parts of Europe that are helping borrowers and lenders meet and exchange credit. Great. And um, what are the hurdles to starting a peer-to-peer -peer kind of facil facilitation site, whether it's you guys, Lending Club? What, what is the hurdle that someone else can just come in and say, well, we're going to do it too? So I've said a few times before that the moat is very large and the hurdles are very high in starting a peer-to-peer -peer platform. It's really like marriage and yoga. It's much <laughs> harder than it actually looks. <laughs> I, unfortunately, I've experienced, well, I shouldn't say unfortunately, I have experience on, on both. I, I'd say that uh, they are both pretty difficult. Um, Ron, a lot of our uh, viewers and listeners uh, here are individual investors that are curious about uh, the idea of peer-to-peer -peer lending and whether that's an appropriate vehicle for them to invest in. Uh, in your experience, what type of investor is a peer-to-peer -peer loan uh, appropriate for? So that's a great question. We have two types of lenders, retail and institutional. And the peer-to-peer -peer finance marketplace is really not a competitive product to equities. It's a fixed income alternative. And so a retail lender, an individual or a high net worth person who would like to build a minimum $10,000 per account, a diversified pool of consumer credit, the minimum dollar bid per loan is $25. So you can see that an oh, wow. individual can work with a peer-to-peer -peer platform like Prosper and invest in numerous diversified borrowers to get access to short duration, short term, fixed rate loans that accrue daily and pay monthly. Okay. Now I don't, it's, you kind of already answered this f for us so we can just do this quickly, but in terms of what this is potentially, it, well, is this an, an alternative to an individual bond, a bond fund or a dividend paying stock, or is the right way to think about this as a new separate asset class? So that's a great question. We're hearing from many financial planners and wealth managers that they are putting a portion of their clients' assets in the fixed income category into peer-to-peer -peer finance loans. And I can tell you why in two quick numbers. If you look at the aggregate U.S. bond market and the index of it, the one-year performance is minus 2.02% as of today. And if they had invested the portion in peer-to-peer -peer finance and done a diversified indexed portfolio, 
the yield would be roughly 8% for that same one-year period. And if we look at the one-month period, the aggregate U.S. bond market index was down negative 0.57%. But if you had indexed the peer-to-peer platform Prosper in a diversified index portfolio, the yield for the one-month period would be plus positive 0.60, so up more than one-half of 1% for the one-month period. So just to clarify for, for our listeners, that those returns, that would include the, the charge-offs in the portfolio as well as any fees associated with the, um, with the loans? That's correct. That would be a net performance number after expenses and defaults. With, uh, with more institutional money coming into the space, whether it be insurance, hedge funds, uh, BDCs, we saw Prospect Capital just yesterday say that they're moving more into the, the peer-to-peer lending space. Are we moving towards a point where this isn't really peer-to-peer anymore and more kind of institution-to-peer, or will that be changing more? So Prosper will always have a very solid commitment to the retail and high net worth and peer-to-peer concept of the exchange and the platform. But you're right. There's no doubt that institutions, business development companies, credit hedge funds, insurance companies, and banks – are very interested in yield products and we're seeing them come to us looking for more inventory but we are committed to and assure our members that we will always be a peer-to-peer platform now ron when i go on the the uh the prosper site uh, i notice that there is a there's a table that shows the returns for 2005 to 2009 uh, vintage loans uh, and i appreciate that that prosper puts that up there to to, to me, it seemed like a way to get a perspective on what happened during the credit downturn. The The performance wasn't all that good. Um, it, it, it was in the negative. Um, so looking ahead to when we do eventually have the next uh, downturn of the credit cycle, what assurance do investors have that uh, they will have performance uh, through the cycle? Obviously, it'll go down, but, but what should they be expecting realistically? Yeah, that's a great question and one we get often. There are really three different versions of Prosper, and the one you just mentioned, that 2005 to 2009 period, is a different firm. It's nothing what Prosper looks like today. And then the second version of Prosper is that 09 to December of 2012 period. And then my partners and I, along with Sequoia Capital, purchased Prosper in January of 2013. So the answer to your question is we have put in new pricing, credit, and risk policies, new servicing and new collections to ensure that the returns from January of 2013 all the way through the future, all the way through the next potential credit crisis, will not look like what Prosper 1.0 was. That old version included lenders negotiating rates with borrowers and many other auction-type systems, which Mm -hmm. is not how Prosper operates at all today. Uh, today, it's a it's a tiered system, right? And the, the pricing is set by Prosper for each uh, credit tier? That's right. So we work with three types of borrowers, people who want to do debt consolidation, people who want to purchase something, and small businesses who want to borrow on their personal credit. And we look at 500 variables for each and every single type of borrower, and we assign not only a letter grade, but an interest rate. And we're working to make sure that that borrower not only has the willingness, but the ability to pay back the lender. Okay. And when, when I think about an investor investing in a Prosper loan, how does the investment typically take place? Are they investing small amounts across a lot of loans? Because I would think that there would be a risk of, if I go in there and I invest in just a couple loans, that my returns will look much different than what the overall Prosper experience has been, because I might have one of the loans that that goes bad, and and that could be an overwhelming part of my experience. That's absolutely right. We think that diversification is key for all lenders, and we work very closely with lenders. If we see somebody come on with too small of an account to get diversified, so if they can't purchase more than 100 loans, we don't think they're diversified, and we're really working with them to ensure they understand the need for diversification, and we're really making sure that people understand the need to invest over time to have a balanced, diversified portfolio. Gotcha. That makes a lot of sense. And and jumping back to the, the pricing system, actually, now that I think about it, it, I, it seems like it was a really uh, savvy move on Prosper's part to move to the fixed pricing system. 
But when you think forward, you've got a lot of institutional money in. Maybe you, you get a lot of a lot more individuals also joining the system. As you get a more liquid market into the Prosper universe, do you see uh, going back to sort of a, an auction market pricing system at some point? I don't see the auction market pricing system returning. I think that history has shown us that lenders aren't the best judges of what rate a borrower should borrow at. And we think that our technology and our very experienced veteran group of pricing risk credit and actuarial people who come from the credit card banking and rating agency and technology industries really have the best credit model for the peer-to-peer platform today. And that's really shown in the net performance of the loans from Prosper for the last 14 months since we've been here at Prosper. Yeah, and you, you talk about lenders historically not being the best at pricing risk all the time, and we're seeing data from the OCC, uh, the Fed survey of some loan officers saying that they're starting to see standards across the board ease a little bit, especially when it comes to consumer credit cards, auto loans, etc. Do you see credit card banks and lenders moving more aggressively into the space and maybe challenging kind of the customers that would be Prosper customers? So I think we're going to see a change in the landscape. I don't know exactly what's going to happen, but given the growth of Prosper and Lending Club now doing in excess of $300 million per month in new loan originations, it's clear that the understanding and awareness of who we are is spreading to the different banks and incumbent credit card companies. And we don't know what the changes will be. Hopefully, there'll be lower interest rates to benefit the borrowers across the board. And Matt hinted at this a little bit earlier in terms of the tiered pricing system. And you guys have something that you call the Prosper rating. Can you talk a little bit about what that is and what the kind of thinking behind that is? Sure can. So there are seven different Prosper ratings. Double A is assigned to the best credit, lowest interest rate borrower. And then there's A, B, C, D, E, and then our HR that higher rate, smaller loan size. And so every borrower who comes to us, we are verifying their identity, employment, occupation, all the data about them. We're pulling social media data, data from the agencies like FICO and Experian, and really studying each individual and assigning a letter and a number and an interest rate to that person. And we might find a borrower who wants to borrow $20,000, but our analysis might come back that that person actually only is able to borrow 10 from us, and it may be a three-year loan request, and we may suggest a five-year based on the amortization and the lower payments, helping that borrower get the right amount of money at the right term to help them rebuild or build or improve their personal financial credit. Right, and um, just thinking about the model of, of a lending club, of a, of a Prosper, it's, it's not a bank. So can you kind of walk us through what kind of banks you work with? Uh, what do you need from a bank in order to operate your, your model successfully? So we use banks for the origination of loans for a very short amount of time, and we hold the cash on behalf of our lenders at large banks. So we're working very closely with the banking community around the country. In fact, we have banks sending us borrowers, and some banks are actually buying AA loans to hold on their balance sheet. So we really think that the banking community has understood we can be a great customer and actually help them facilitate what they're looking for as well. But the way it works is we link to the borrower's bank account, we process their request for money. In an average of four days, we will have found the lenders to fulfill the loan, we will originate the loan, and then we will work with the bank to put the money in the borrower's account, and then every month we will work with the borrower's bank to take their payments electronically from the borrower's bank, and then we will give back each month to the different lenders who've invested in that borrower's loan. So that's that's interesting. It's The banks then don't necessarily need to see Prosper as the enemy moving in to disintermediate, but more as a as a partner that, that is opening up a new opportunity? We think the banks are um, not our competition. We actually think that our competition is education and awareness for borrowers and lenders. I had breakfast with the president of one of the country's biggest banks on Saturday in Chicago, 
And there's a lot that the banks can do and want to do with the peer-to-peer platforms. Great. And looking ahead, I, I, I heard you talk about this at a, a conference you were at. I, I, I saw the video online, and you were, you were talking about the idea that this could be paired with a social network down the road. Uh, to me, uh, Facebook and LinkedIn came immediately to mind. Uh, I was curious if you could spill the beans for us on any, on any discussions or any plans going on that could link up Prosper uh, with one of these social networks. Yeah, there's no answer to the question, and uh, even if I knew it, I probably wouldn't tell you what the answer was. <laughs> I, I know. I was. Uh, I, but I, was I think needed... it's a great question and one we talk about often. If you look just for example, and I'm not foreshadowing anything specific, look how Priceline has moved in between the airlines and the hotels. And look how some of the other fintech, financial tech firms have moved in between the recruiting agencies and some of the other old line businesses. It wouldn't surprise anyone to see Amazon, eBay, Yahoo, Apple, Google better integrate this peer-to-peer solution, Mm -hmm. borrowing and lending, into their networks. That's interesting. Would would Prosper ever move in the direction of becoming more like a more like a social network itself uh, in terms of connecting people with other people? Well, that's a great question. It's not something we're going to be doing this quarter or next. We do have 2 million members who have visited and done business with Prosper as borrowers or lenders. But you're right. We are a big data. We're a financial technology firm, and uh, we do connect people with money. 2 million is not a bad starting point. Uh, well, Ron, we really appreciate your time. We really appreciate you joining us and explaining a little bit more about Prosper and the, the peer-to-peer lending opportunity in general. Thank you both. Great stuff from Ron there. And as always, let's just head right to the Twitter sphere to finish out the week. What do you got? Let's do it. This one is from Professor Jeremy at Jeremy HL. Warren Buffett's idea of heaven I don't have to work with people I don't like. And that links out to an article on Forbes, hashtag Buffett, hashtag BRK. I read that, David, and I wonder, what are are you doing here? Why am (laughs) I? There's the long laugh. Very, very enlightening. Not surprising, though, from Buffett. He always gives us the tidbits. So it's a lot, of, a lot about culture. We hear a lot about Buffett and uh, the managers that he chooses for the businesses at Berkshire Hathaway. And, uh, and, and that says a lot about how he, how he thinks about choosing people, how he thinks about the people that he's going to work with. And not even just at Berkshire. If you look at other companies, low turnover at the top is usually a good thing. When we see banks churning through management, it's usually not the best time for the bank. You look at Bank of America, a lot of churn at the top there. When, bank, when Brian Moynihan came on, mm. Sally Krawcheck, gone. Joe Price, who's head of consumer, gone. So a lot of turnover there. It just Not that it's a bad thing in the long run, but it creates some you short-term wanna get, You want to get some stability there at some point. Indeed. Where, whereas if you look at Wells Fargo, kind of a stable base there at the top, and it kind of always has been. Right. How does it feel to be a Tupac-style hologram? by the way. It feels real good. Feels I mean, real good. Yeah, feel healthy. You have a little extra swagger. Yeah. All right. Well, that's our show for today. That's our show for the week. I'm Matt Copenheffer. This here is David Hansen. We'll see you next week. People on the show may have interest in the stocks they talk about, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against. Don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear.